All right, we're interviewing Mr. Charles J. Smith from Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, today is uh, February 25th, 2002. Uh, we're doing the interview at the Water Vliet Arsenal. Uh, now, Mr. Smith, tell us, uh, who is that guy on the, on the stamp? Well, that is supposed to be me. That's a representative of me because you can't be uh, a living person and be on a United States stamp. Uh -huh. And what happened was that uh, the uh, engraver of the stamp took composites of different actions by the uh, National Guard, the Army mm -hmm. National Guard. And this is the 150th anniversary. So we're now at the 200th anniversary of the National Guard. And that's why I thought it would be of interest right. to uh, have this recorded rather than just have it in my, well, my house. Tell us about the picture. Yeah, you, you well, what happened was that um, we were out uh, uh, digging foxholes. This was up in Camp Drum mm -hmm. in, the summer of, uh, in the summer of 52, in August. And uh, we came into the compound and a jeep pulled up and a captain jumped out and said uh, I'm to take pictures of uh, Sergeant Smith and so I said Be the background of that is kind of humorous um, I was in the Navy from 1945 to 49 I was a gunner's mate I was on a couple of battleships the North Carolina and the Texas and they're both monuments which I'm very proud of and among other things. I played football in the Navy, I swam in the Navy. I had a great career in the four years. And when I got out, I went to prep school for six months to be sure I know how to read and write again to get into classes. And uh, then in uh, January of 1950, I uh, matriculated at St. John's University School of Business and Commerce at Skirmahorn Street, which is no longer exists. They have a beautiful campus out of Long Island. And then come along June of 1950, the North Koreans invaded the South Koreans, mm -hmm. and two guys were called right back in. Because on our, on our discharge card, we have a number, and uh, that number tells the Bureau of the Navy uh, what my billet was, and if they needed someone like that, they'd call that number up and I'd be in. Mm -hmm. So I thought, geez, I want to get on with my life and get my education done. I put my time in, if this is a national emergency, I'm ready to go. If not, uh, I want to continue in the style I'm living right now, going to school. So that went on for 50 and 51. And in the middle of 1951, I really got scared. I thought that this was really going to happen. So I looked around, and on the bulletin board was a sign for an administrative assistant for the 106th Infantry, Company M, National Guard. 42nd Rainbow Division. Now, where were they out of? That, uh, that was an armory on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. where I live, mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. So I went up there, and I saw Captain Kennedy, and I gave him my background. And While I was in the Navy, uh, we, had a, we had a booklet, and I was stationed down in Norfolk, and we were with the convoy escort piers. We had these small aircraft carriers. And uh, there were several landing ships and what have you. And our duty was to uh, inspect the guns to be sure they weren't rusting and what have you. And we had a little shack on the dock, and that's where we hung out. And in there was a book, How to Type. So I opened it up, and it had L.C. Smith, and there was an L.C. Smith. So I went through the whole book, never talked to anyone. And at the end, I was typing 45 words a minute in about three months. <laughs> So I knew how to type. So I told him that I could type. And he said, well, he said, okay, join the guard. And uh, you have a, a position now as administrative assistant for Company M. Well, of course, in the Navy, everything is mister. And in the Army, everything is corporal, sergeant, captain, major, general. So every now and then I'd say mister, and I'd say, Smith, you're in the Army now. So that was kind of an undercurrent of humor. Mm -hmm. So we got up to uh, Camp Drum, and uh, I wound up in a uh, bar, and um, I'll never forget it. It was a big, long bar, and all, a lot of the guys were in there. I came in, he had to come down three steps, and somehow or other we got singing. 
and we're singing, and the beers were lined up. There must have been 30 beers lined up. We could never, it was a keg lined up there. And I looked up at one point, and here was Captain Kennedy with an MP, okay, going around checking. And he, he recognized me. So I think the two things happened that converged. When the photographer came in to see him about taking a picture of a typical sergeant, which I really wasn't, okay, because I've really been a Navy man. <laughs> he said, you go see Sergeant Smith. He's a typical sergeant on the basis of the humor of my Navy background and then being in the uh, slop shoot, having a good time with, uh, with the guys singing. So now I go into the barracks and uh, I grabbed someone's uh, knapsack with the bandolier. Mm -hmm. And as you see, the bandolier is up right. like a rainbow. And that's not GI. GI should be horizontal. So right away when, when they asked me, do you think this is you? I didn't look at anything, but I just looked at that. I said, oh, yeah, I know that's me because that is wrong right there. And uh, so then I grabbed a gun and I had a helmet, you know, a liner. And I came outside and he said, okay, uh, he had me go through all these different poses. I must have done about 15 different poses. And all the guys are standing around looking, like, what the hell is this all about? You know, really funny. So finally, he said, well, get into port arms. So I get into port arms and I was so angry at this point because I thought this was just an exercise in futility that I got a hold of the gun and I, I went like, I, I know I made one hell of a face in. And all of a sudden I get a letter in the mail saying, that's you. <laughs> who'd, the, who'd that letter come from? Uh, the fellow who took the picture. Uh, yeah, CBS Television. He's, he's with CBS okay. Television. He says, uh, I'm the public information officer of the 42nd Infantry Rainbow Division, New York National Guard. If you recall, I think you'll remember me as having a photographer take a picture of you at Camp Drum in 51, not 52, 51. You were in Company M of the 106th Infantry. That picture has traveled a long way since then. If my information is correct, it's along with others I took at that time, were used by the artist to engrave a three cent National Guard commemorative stamp. According to the people of 106, it's your face that's on the stamp. I'd appreciate it if you would hold, uh, get hold of one out of the issues and uh, take a look at it. A proper reply would be most welcome. Jack Foster, CBS TV Film Department, uh, New York. But please, for heaven's sake, don't give this to any newspaper yet, because they wanted to have, you know, right. the the right to it. So I got that, and. Uh, I said, oh my God, yes. So I was at Springfield College, and uh, so they got a hold of, I don't know how they did it, but they got a hold of me up there. And um, the, uh, the local newspaper came up and took a picture of me and what have you, and, uh, and it was in the, the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this one is uh, uh, with my mother, um, in the New York uh, Daily News, spring of 1953. And it says, it isn't everybody who gets his portrait on a postage stamp, so the excitement and pride at the home of the Samuel Smiths, uh, 195 Lafayette Avenue of Brooklyn, was understandable when a National Guard confirmed the stamp issued by the Post Office Department carried a likeness of their son, former Sergeant Charles, 24 picture to right above the National Guard outfit. His beaming Mars had left. Charles joined the Guard after four years in the Navy. He is now majoring in further education at Springfield College. The Guardsman on the stamp is a composite of a number of photos except for the face. The strong features of Charles' countenance appeal to the artists who designed the stamp. And that's because I, I gave it that. <laughs> so the other funny part about this is that uh, in the summer of uh, 53, I uh, was up at Bear Mountain, uh, New York. My folks have a home just out of Bay Mountain in a little town called Fort Montgomery. And uh, so we all worked at Bear Mountain in one, one way or another. I was a lifeguard. And uh, one day um, in August, um, I went up to have lunch at the inn, came down, and, uh, and the gal taking tickets said, stand by that phone out there, you're going to get a phone call. So I said, okay. 
So I stood by the phone booth and sure enough the phone rang. And this lady uh, got on the phone and she said, are you Charlie Smith? I said, yeah. She said, oh my God, I've been trying to get you for three months. She said, how would you like to be on television? I said, what? She said, don't hang up. I said, what's this all about? She said, well, you're on a stamp. I said, yeah, that's right. And she said, we'd like to have you on the I've Got a Secret show with Gary Moore. I said, oh my God, really? Yeah. So uh, we set a date, you know. And I forget what night it was on. It was on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And um, so I went, uh, I went down, and uh, my wife is in the car right now. And uh, she came down from Massachusetts. We were dating at that time, so we got engaged that night. <laughs> that was a momentous night, you know. What better night to be on television, have my 15 minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, there were four of us, and we were sitting around backstage, and uh, Gary Moore came in and shook hands, and he went back in the wings, and then the uh, Jane Meadows and, and um, Bill Cullum and, and Henry Morgan and uh, uh, the other guy, I have it here. Um, they looked us over. So, f so then I decided I had to go talk to Gary Moore. So I go into the wings and he's sitting there all by himself getting, you know, this is a show that's the number one show on television mm -hmm. at the time and at least 25 million people watching or more. And I said, uh, Mr. Moore, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. He said, oh, wonderful. And I said, I want you to know that when the show is over, I'm going to get engaged. After this, this is a great moment in my life. I'm going to get engaged tonight. I'm going to never forget this. And he said, oh, great. All of a sudden, the producer comes running. I go, what the? Get out of here. This guy's getting ready to go on. <laughs> so finally, it's my time. And uh, and so I walk out on the stage. I'm going to tell you the truth, okay? I mean, this may not be for everybody to hear, but I'll tell you the truth. I walked out on the stage. The keg lights are bright. You can hardly see the audience. And, of course, there were no film in those days, mm -hmm. all live. And I sat down, and he shook my hand, and he said, Well, Charles, uh, he said, uh, Why don't you whisper your secret in my ear? And I said, I'm scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> and he did not bat an eye. He just looked over and he said, you sure do take a licking. And that was a throw to them, okay, to try to help them figure out mm -hmm. what it was. Well, Henry Morgan and Bill Cullen were so funny. It was unbelievable. I mean, Henry Morgan said, yeah, he looks like he probably posed for a little Abner. I'll never forget that. And uh, Bill Cullen came up with a few other things and then they got discussing well you know what is it what what you know they're trying to get the licking they couldn't get the licking you know he was a poster boy for uh, Superman or you know whatever mm -hmm. so then we had a confrontation I had a talk with Gary and, and we, you know, it was a big show you know and we talked back and forth about nothing so when it was all over I won eighty dollars <laughs> I didn't even charge them for uh, my gas mileage from Bear Mountain to New York and back, you know, and I mean, in those days you didn't think of those things. And eighty dollars, not too many people in 1953 were making eighty dollars a week. Did anybody guess who you were? No, they didn't guess it. They didn't. They didn't get the licking. They were surprised. So we won. You know, it was great. So those are the two big happenings. But the greatest, the greatest thrill of this is the number of people that have written me asking for my autograph on a stamp. Mm -hmm. And it's very valuable. And I got a letter from King Farouk uh, asking for it. He sent me the uh, first day issue stamp. That's mm -hmm. the big thing. And uh, that's, you know, that's been great. But the greatest thrill of all is that uh, my stamp, and I have to say my stamp, uh, the National Guard stamp, along with other military stamps, are on display at Arlington National Cemetery, and that's a thrill. So you go to the visitor center, and there's a table in there, and in it, on the glass, are several stamps. And, Amazing. And uh, so the National Guard is at uh, Arlington National Cemetery.
Now, one of the things that uh, you're going to donate is, yeah. now oh, what yeah. is this? Well, my dad, of course, my folks were really thrilled. You know, they, they just couldn't believe it. So uh, he actually worked the four to midnight. He was a printing pressman. Mm -hmm. He ran a uh, uh, five-color web press, a huge, okay. huge press, and excellent craftsman. So he's on the BMT, the subway, the BMT, Borough Manhattan Transit. Mm -hmm. And he looks up, and they have this poster up there, so he gets his knife out, and he cuts it out. Because there weren't too many people on the subway at that time of night, or that time of morning. And so that's what I have. I have this one as the original. And then the others, this was in, uh, uh, in the subway mm -hmm. uh, station. Uh, and it was all, all over the country. Uh, now, you have to realize that there were a lot of guys after World War II who stayed with the military because they were in for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were in for six years. They got in maybe in 38, get out, or 39, get out in 45. And so they thought, well, they would stay with it and uh, maintain their relationship. So the National Guard had a lot of great, great infantrymen, great soldiers. Mm -hmm. But then the North Koreans invaded the South, and then the wives were saying, you know, you, you put your time in. Uh, we don't want you going back in there unless everybody has to go. And that mm -hmm. was what we all felt. Mm -hmm. If everybody has to go, we'll go. So they were leaving uh, in droves. And they were losing a lot of great, you know, knowledgeable men. Right. So they apparently decided to do something, and this is the thing that they did. Now, yeah. this year is the 200th anniversary, and nothing's being done that I know of. Mm -hmm. They're not even raising the flag twice. So it's kind of interesting how situations dictate right. what you're going to do. So you don't think you're going to make the 200th stand? Uh, they're not going to know that. Well, that's... <laughs> I have all this stuff, and I said to myself, there has to be a museum somewhere wow. that would be interested, especially in New York. Absolutely. And um, so I called, and I had a tough time getting um, the arson, the armory that I was associated with, a beautiful, beautiful armory, is now a homeless such. Right. And I spoke with this gal, finally, somewhere in Brooklyn, and she said, well, I'll give you the number for the museum up about the side of Albany. And I spoke with Robert, I guess, and then he put me on to you. Well, very good. And um, so that's how I, so I thought, well, if there is a, uh, uh, a museum, a historical museum, they should be interested in uh, Absolutely. Happened. That's a wonderful grouping of material. I yeah, mean, you... It's uh, 50 years ago, and I'm only 22. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, but um, I was going to say something else. Um, oh yeah, uh, Memorial Day in uh, '52. We marched uh, on Fifth Avenue. And we were Rainbow Division, so mm -hmm. we all had a kind of a blue kerchief up here. And we're all spiffed up, and uh, I got two tickets. For my folks, because uh, um, we go back to the Civil War as far as military goes, mm -hmm. and um, so we're very proud. So I got him in the grandstand. And we're marching down Fifth Avenue. And I'm saying I could see them looking for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm in. I'm in two. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get them to know? Fine. I'm looking at all these faces, you know, <laughs> all these kids. Must be 10,000 going down. So as we got close to them, I had the gun here. And we're all swinging our arms. So when I got to where they were really looking, I, everybody swung back. I swung up and waved like that. Well, geez, they just about fell out of the grandstand. Oh, my God, this guy is unbelievable. 
how did he figure that out? And it just came to me in an instant, you know, how am I going to let them know? So I, instead of swinging back, I just swung all the way up, <laughs> looking great. straight ahead. That's oh, great. it was funny. They loved it. Yeah, they loved it. <laughs> so it's been, uh, it's been a, a thrill. Oh, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. Well, we appreciate you sharing this yeah, with us. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be happy to leave you. And I, unfortunately, what I've done is I've, I've taken this, and a photographer has uh, taken a photograph of it in Technicolor. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then we had it blown up. Mm -hmm. And it's in another packet, so I'll send That's it up okay. to you. And, uh, but right now, I want to be sure that you get all that tells the story about this so that uh, you have the history of it. Well, this is wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure, Nick. Absolutely. <laughs> my pleasure. Well,